my daughter is coming I'm sure with, uh, there are many uh, different Ken. ways that we would they like to improve our, our health, health, right? We had David. So many here. different ways. So she was I know for the longest time, so I just like, oh, wanted to get better sleep. That was something I was really wanting to have. Um, we're quality sleep. And it's really important. That's, that's one simple thing that can affect so many other things in life, right? right. Um, but as we get into tonight's topic, let's just uh, begin with a word of prayer and ask God to be with us tonight. So if you'd bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for giving us another day of life. We thank you for uh, the joy that we can find knowing you, having a relationship with you, being restored day by day, back into your image. And Lord, we pray that tonight as we talk about one other way that you want to restore us back into your image, uh, that you would uh, just continue to speak to our hearts individually and personally, that you would help us to live healthier and happier lives day by day um, as we follow you. We thank you and we this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So just by way of review, uh, first night we talked about Daniel chapter 2, prophecy, how God doesn't leave us in the dark, which is a blessing. We've gone through things like the sanctuary, uh, the salvation that God gives us, the second coming, the fact that Jesus is coming soon, amen? He's coming soon. And last night we looked at the fact that there would be an apostasy, or a falling away from the pureness of God's church, and that there would be there would be a need for those um, who truly love God to keep it pure. So we looked into that. We looked into the Antichrist power last night, and tonight we'll be talking about a very interesting topic dear to my heart. My father is a physician, and growing up, I had plenty of talk about health in the house. And tonight we'll be talking about the amazing subject of health. Believe it or not, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, diabetes has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. Interesting statistics. Next one here we can see on the next slide is the average American's health costs have doubled in just 10 years. So the actual costs have doubled. Heart disease is the nation's number one killer, followed closely by cancer. And over half of the U.S. population, including teenagers and children, are overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. This, is, this blew my mind. Look at the next one. It says, the average cost for a doctor's visit is $60 or $6,800 for a visit with a specialist. This doesn't include the finances lost and stress caused from missing work or school. In their lifetime, the average American will spend $51,334 on medication alone. That's $650 per year just on medication. Is health something that we should be paying attention to? Health is extremely important. And I guess the question is, what does the Bible say about health? What does the Bible say about health? That's a great question. You know, a lot of times we we tend to pass over this a little bit. And one of the cool things is, is the Bible actually has quite a bit to say about health. Because if God wants to restore us spiritually, would it make sense that he also wants to restore us physically? And as you look around the world today, this is what I find very interesting. We have more medical technology than ever in history. However, we are sicker than we ever have been in history. And think about it. When, when we come together on Sabbath and we get ready to pray together and we ask for prayer requests, 95% of the requests deal with what? Yeah. No. So the question is, has God given us some instruction on how we can live a happy, healthy life? When we look at these statistics, is there something that we can find in here that will help us reduce that stress, those costs, and actually help us delay death. That was a very interesting thing to think about. 
So what does the Bible say about health? Let's go to Daniel chapter 1. We've been looking a little bit here at Daniel. I think it's safe to say that we've, we've built quite a bit of trust in God's word through the book of Daniel. <clears throat> so if you'll go to number 855 in the seminar Bible, 855, we're going to go back to the book of Daniel. Only now we're going to read the beginning of Daniel's story. And the question is, what does the beginning of Daniel's story tell us about health? Because Daniel had quite a career in the Babylonian Empire. And so the question is, is what, what does his story tell us about health? We're going to start in verse 3, Daniel chapter 1. Verse 3, Daniel's been taken captive into Babylon. And it says this, Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. So as Nebuchadnezzar and his armies go into Israel and they conquer Israel, they then say, okay, let's bring back some people that could be of value to us. See, the Babylonians were quite uh, advanced in their thinking when it came to conquering nations because they were opportunists. So as they saw that they could benefit from captives and bringing them back to Babylon, they would look and find the good looking, the smart, the noble, people who could be of benefit to the Babylonian Empire. And they would bring them back to Babylon. So let's look at verse 4. It says, So they're bringing back some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So here, let's bring the cream of the crop back to Babylon. Verse 5, the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So they have a three-year training period, and during this time, they are going to be given the king's choice food. Now, this was, this was an honor, because the king, who was very important to their religious society, if he gave you his food, that food had been sacrificed for him for their gods. It had been dedicated to their, their gods and their deities, and it was an honor to receive this food from the king. So let's look at verse 6. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And the interesting part is, they would, they would bring them to Babylon, and they would change their names. So what they're doing is they're changing their identity. You are no longer, and their names had to do with their gods. So you are no longer Hebrew, you are now Babylonian. Verse 8. But it, this, is, this is the interesting part here. It says, but Daniel did what? Purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now this is an important phrase here at the beginning of this verse. It says that Daniel purposed in his heart. He made a conscious decision at the beginning of this process that I will be true to what God has given me. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to go back and look at that in a few moments here. But Daniel purpose, he makes a purpose in his heart. He makes a decision. He makes a covenant. I'm going to stick. I'm going to be faithful. We talk about righteousness by faith, right? Tonight we're going to take a look at health by faith. So look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, 
Verse 10, the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who you are, who are your age? Then would you endanger my head before the king? So, Daniel makes a special request. And the chief there says, hang on a second. But you're going to look worse than everybody else. And I'm going to get in trouble because it's going to look like I'm not taking care of you. Verse 11, so Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said this. Verse 12. Please test your servants for how long? Ten days. ten days. He says, please test your servants for ten days. And let them give us what? Vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you. And the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So Daniel says this. I love this. He says, okay, let's do a little test. Ten days. Not very long. We can all do that. Ten days. Let's do ten days, and at the end of ten days, let's do a little test. You can decide. So Daniel is actually putting his faith in his God right here. My God says something very important about my diet, so I'm going to put it to the test. And let's see if within a short amount of time, as short as ten days, let's see in ten days, will you see a physical difference between what God has given me and what Babylon has given me. So he consented with him in this manner and he tested them for 10 days. Verse 15, and at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who had ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them veggie tables. <laughs> Verse 17, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, which is what we've been talking about during this series. Verse 19, now at the end of the 10 days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about the king, which in all matters of wisdom and understanding, about which the king examined them, he found them ten times. How many? Ten times. ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Now this is very interesting because it's only a matter of ten days. And within ten days, Daniel and his friends are visibly and mentally superior than those who are eating of the king's table. Now, diet was very important because this is what Daniel and his friends would have been saying if they had accepted the king's food. If they had accepted the king's food, they would have been saying, my strength comes from your gods. Because this was food that had been sacrificed and dedicated to and was a part of the Babylonian religion. So when it says Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself, he said, no, I'm going to stick to what God has given me because my strength comes from my God. Now remember when we, the first night, for those of you who are here, God said in Isaiah 46, I am the one true God. There is none like me. And then in Isaiah 41, he put, he put a test before the other gods, right? If you are a god, tell the end from the beginning. And here's the other interesting part. Here we see that God is put to the test again, right? Only this time with what he's instructed his servants to eat. 
and we find a physical and mental difference between the two. Now, let's go to this verse here. Exodus 15, 26. I want to point this out to you. This is what the Lord says to the people as they're coming out of Egypt. So God's people were in captivity in Egypt for quite some time. This is long before the Babylonian captivity. And God brings them out of Egypt. And this is what he tells them. He says, if you will diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the what? Diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Now this is a very interesting statement. He says it again in, in Deuteronomy. Now here's my question for you. When God makes this promise, see here's the thing. When we think about God's law and what he's given us, sometimes we think about it in terms of uh, arbitrary dictatorship. In other words, they're like, well, God gave them all this law. I'm like, well, you guys got to keep you in order here because you're crazy, so don't eat this and worship me on this day. And what else can I think of? But is that how God operates? See, there's a reason that God gives us his law. Because, believe it or not, following God's law is a natural blessing. Because when he says none of these diseases will come upon you, he's not saying that because he's up there going, if you do what I say, I will put the force around you. And when people sneeze, it will bounce off of you. <laughs> but that's what we think, right? If I obey God, then he's going to magically do these things. But just as sure as if I climb to the top of the Empire State Building and jump off, just as sure as gravity will take me to the ground, the laws that God gives us in Scripture have the same result. When He gives us these things, there's a reason. And guess what? Can I beat, can I beat gravity? Oh, no, I cannot. And so the question is, when God gives us these things, are they natural Laws that bring natural healings and natural blessings. Amen. Did you catch that? Just as sure as gravity works, it's a law that we cannot change. We're going to find tonight that God's health laws work in the exact same way. But here's the interesting part. It says, I have brought you out of Egypt, right? And I will not put the diseases on you that were of the Egyptians. I want to show you, and I say me, we, we want to show you a, a video clip. Archaeology has shown us some very interesting things about the diseases that the Egyptians were dying from. And the other interesting part, I want you to look at this. I want you to, I want you to see if this describes our world today and what we're struggling with and the health crisis that we see in our world today. This is what they're discovering about an ancient civilization quite a long time ago. Radiology, we've had the ability to go back 3,500 years in time. The Egyptian mummies dating back uh, 3,500 years ago have been studied by autopsy, where they cut into the mummy and they look at the various organs and arteries, and also by CT scans. Through medical technology that didn't exist until recently, we can look at CT scans, we can look at MRIs. We can basically, uh, through these imaging devices, begin to understand the diseases of the ancient Egyptians. The paleopathologists are able to determine what types of diseases they had through x-rays and through different types of tests. Paleopathology is a study of diseases of ancient man. And they can look inside. And what they're discovering is actually fascinating. The upper echelon of the Egyptian society uh, suffered from the very same diseases that the upper echelon or middle class and upper class of, of our Western culture deals with today. In fact, uh, Ramesses the Great is believed to have died from a heart attack. Heart disease, very common cause of death. Cancer, very common cause of death. Gallbladder disease was rampant uh, there with gallstones, with the increased cholesterol. Gallstones are always associated, or most often associated, with very high fat diet. Again, consistent with the same kind of diet we have in Western nations. The famous Queen Hatshepsut, her mummy has been identified. 
And uh, Hatshepsut was probably the most powerful female ruler that ever lived. She actually ruled Egypt as king. She wore the royal headdress with the cobra. She even wore the beard that the uh, pharaohs wore. Hatshepsut is believed to have died from obesity, diabetes, and liver cancer. And the Egyptians did suffer uh, from diseases that we suffer from today simply because they also had a very similar lifestyle to what we have today. One of the food products and major parts of the diet of the ancient Egyptians was definitely meat products. The Egyptians thrived, if you will. Maybe thrived is too strong a word, but they enjoyed, at least the wealthy did, their rich foods, their, their fowl, their meat sources. Any person of history knows who mummies were. They were the priests, the priestess, the kings, the queens. They're also called pharaohs. It was these affluent folks that began to develop the atherosclerosis and whatnot that, that we're seeing today. Uh, they were obese. Uh, they had, as I mentioned, artery disease all over the body. They had the diseases of rich people. Those that had diets of overabundance, maybe, you know, every breakfast, lunch, and dinner was kind of like Christmas, Thanksgiving, and New Year's in terms of the diet, and that was killing them, and it's killing us. However, it's quite interesting when you look at some of the earlier dynasties in ancient Egypt, and the paleopathologists studied the causes of death in those times, they actually ate more of a plant-based diet. They didn't refine their date sugar, they had more whole food plant foods, and they did not have the level of diseases that the latter dynasties had when they ate all types of animal products and unhealthy food. So as we look at the Egyptian mummies, we see diseases that are facing us today. And they're, they're discovering a tremendous amount of information. And we now know that if you choose that lifestyle, it doesn't matter if it was 4,000 years ago, you're going to have the same diseases. The lifestyle predicts the outcome. There's lessons that we can learn today when, when you look at the older culture, which ate more of a healthy diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, unrefined foods, unrefined date sugar, whole plant foods. They had better health. And you compared it to the later dynasties of ancient Egypt, where they ate more of a diet, actually, more like uh, Western diets today. They had all these types of diseases that we have today, the heart disease, the cancer, diabetes, etc. Ancient Egyptian mummies, as we study them, are unlocking questions we've had for millennia about health, why people live, why people die. As we know why they were dying, but they, they answered questions not about the past, but also that we have in the present. What should we be eating now? And really, if we take that information, they're helping us uh, know what we should eat even in the future. Fast forward a little bit to the Roman culture everywhere Rome was. Now, I like, there's a line in there where he says, the lifestyle predicts the what? The outcome. The lifestyle predicts the outcome. And as they study these cultures, what they're finding is, they're experiencing the same problems, or they were experiencing the same problems that we're experiencing today, not because it's genetic, but because it's a lifestyle that people are living. And so the question is, is, is what can we do to help reverse this trend that is taking place? There's a story I want to share with you tonight about a lioness named Little Tyke. I don't know if anyone's heard this story before, but it was a really intriguing story for me to see uh, the effects of this on animals. And this, this little, little lioness, when it was born, it was born to a mother who, in the seven years previous to Little Tyke's birth, this mother had immediately killed each of the other four <coughs> babies that she had given birth to as soon as they were born. Um, very, very violent birth. Little Tyke was born barely alive, her leg was hanging off, and her rescuer, George, all, all he could say was, oh, you poor Little Tyke, and that's, that's why this lioness came out with the name Little Tyke, but they started by helping this, this lioness actually on the screen drink from bottles of water, or bottles of warm milk, just warm milk, trying to drink warm milk, and experts started saying, 
now you need to transition, you know, from milk to solid food, and they have to eat meat. Experts said if, if lions don't eat meat, they won't survive. And so they tried weaning her off of the milk by giving her bones that were from freshly um, cut up beef, and they tried to take take away all of her previous toys and give her these bones to eat on to start getting used to the meat flavor. But the interesting thing was, as soon as she even smelled it, she threw up and couldn't eat it. And they tried this for months as the lioness was growing up and they started, they put out a, a thousand dollar reward. They said, if anyone can devise a way to get our lion to eat meat, you're gonna get a thousand dollars. It, it's interesting though, because one young visitor came by their ranch one day and said specifically, I quote, don't you read the Bible? Read Genesis 1.30 and you'll get your answer. <laughs> at, at the first opportunity George had, he, start, he read it and then he immediately stopped worrying. Uh, this, this little lioness ended up having a few really close friends, a couple of kittens, a lamb, and even a fawn. But, but what was it that they read in the Bible that changed how they thought about raising their lioness? Let's turn in the Bible to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see something very interesting from the Bible from the very beginning and how this related to little tyke. But Genesis chapter 1 and verse, we're going to start with verse 29 and we'll go to verse 30. It's on page one, if you're wondering. Page <laughs> one. Lots of girl to buy. All right, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. It says, And God said, this is in creation, creation week, and, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for what? For food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. So it's interesting here. What was the original diet that was given to not only humans, but also animals? It was plants. Uh, the original diet was plants, seeds, and fruits, even for animals. Uh, they, were, they were to eat it, and it made sense, right? Because before sin, I mean, it's not like animals were going to go around killing each other because there's no death, right? So in a perfect world, there's no death. So all they have to eat is these plants, seeds, and fruit. Interestingly enough. Now, the amazing thing is, as soon as George read this verse, he stopped worrying and he started feeding this Linus a vegetarian lifestyle. And he's been vegetarian, she's been vegetarian all of her life. Which weighs over 300 pounds, <laughs> super strong lioness, and disproved the theory that, that lions had to eat meat to survive. She was a, a little bit of an exception, but the point here is that they went back to the diet, not purposefully, but discovered this original diet in the Garden of Eden. Now, there are many people out there, we just talked about animals, right? There are people out there who operate on a very high uh, energy lifestyle, right? And we know that if we're going to be active and we're going to be running and jumping, what do we need a lot of? Rockstar. <laughs> Red Bull. What do we look? What do we look? What, is, what does the television tell us that we need? Protein, right? Protein. If you're gonna get big and strong, you need more protein. And the best place to get protein, according to Tyson, meat products, <laughs> is in the meat, right? And you grow up with this, right? All the charts that have been put out tell us the protein comes from the animal product. I want to show you some people in the world today who are operating on a plant-based whole foods diet. This first one here is Austin Ayers. He is a wrestler. 
He is uh, a world tag team champion. Um, you can see he's a, he's a pretty buff guy, and he's 210 pounds, five foot nine. And here's what he has to say. He says, it's about understanding that we have choices in the food that we eat. A lot that is put out there by the corporate food system just isn't very good for us. At the end of the day, it's up to us to take the power back, inform ourselves, and learn about the food that's in place and maybe force corporations to have a little bit more social responsibility because it's the food that's killing us. The next person here, Tia Blanco. She is a professional surfer. She's a member of the Surfing America team who made the transition to a completely plant-based diet from her lifelong vegetarian one after reading a book, The China Study, and watching a documentary called Forks Over Knives. Both of them, I highly recommend that you check out. Forks Over Knives is on Netflix. I know most of us have it. Get on there, check it out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to enlighten you on some things. It says, she says, when asked if she felt a vegan diet was enough for a top surfer, she said, yes, in fact, I feel more energized than ever before. I am rarely ever sore after my workouts, and I also find myself reaching a higher athletic level. The next person, Venus Williams, maybe you've heard of her. I think she just won another <coughs> title this weekend. <laughs> oh, the other one, sorry. One of the Williams, one of them did. This is what she says, after being diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome, an autoimmune disease which produces symptoms of chronic fatigue, shortness of breath, and muscle aches, Williams chose to take better care of her body and treat her symptoms by going on a plant-based diet. And here's what she has to say, changing my diet has made a big difference. This next guy, I really like this guy. When I started talking about this, this is uh, Scott Jurek. When I started talking about this in Bible class, we, we did a little challenge with the students about going on a plant-based diet for 10 days like Daniel did. And there were several students who raised their hand and said, Mr. Carpenter, but I'm on the cross-country team. I said, that's fantastic. And they said, but I, I have to eat the meat. And I said, why? And they said, because I have to run a 5K every day. So I said, let me share something with you. Scott Jurek, no list of plant-based athletes would be complete without this ultra marathon running machine. Winning the Western States Endurance, endurance Run, which is a hundred mile course seven years in a row. He is also an American record holder for running 165.7 miles in 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> He's the human equivalent of the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> and he has been operating on a plant-based Whole Foods Diet since 1997. He has a book, you should check it out. It's really inspirational. It's called Eat and Run. And it's filled with information about how to fuel your life with a plant-based Whole Foods Diet. Jason Sager, racking up 60 career victories in mountain biking. Sager has been vegan since he was 17 years old. Quote, I find being a vegan athlete is an asset in that so much detail is put into your diet that it's only natural for meals to be of the highest quality, something imperative as an athlete. And just in case some of you like to get huge, and you're like, but I need it to get big. <laughs> Let me share with you a man named Patrick. <laughs> Patrick won the title of Germany's strongest man in 2011. That same year, that same year, he went vegan after eating a vegetarian diet for 10 years. 
He went on to achieve a world record yoke walk of 1,212 pounds. Telling the crowd after the achievement, this is a message to all of you out there that think you need to eat animal products to be fit and to be strong. That is quite the achievement for someone. All fuel on a plant-based, whole foods diet that we can find right here in Scripture. And the benefits go far beyond being buff and strong. I think a lot of times, too, we can look at it and think, oh, you know, I, I need to start out being vegan. You know, we're talking a lot about people who have chosen to be vegan. And, and making that step, it, it can take some time. It can take a little bit of learning. You know, how do I actually make food that tastes good that's vegan? You know, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. You well, know? you marry Heidi, that's what you do. <laughs> in case you were wondering. Yeah, see, he became vegan just a little bit before we got married. And a lot of it, he was super excited because he wanted to be vegan, but he didn't quite know how to cook some of those things. Which consisted of ordering Taco Bell without cheese on my burrito. <laughs> that's all he would do. <laughs> but, <laughs> the, I think the bottom line is, you know, I have grown up in a home where my mom, um, my, my mom and dad, they chose to be vegetarian when they got married. Uh, and then as soon as they had us as kids, they said, well, why don't we try being vegan as soon as the kids are coming in so that they can just learn on being vegan. And so I was really thankful for that. So I didn't have to like train my James buds, you know, to go another way. But I also grew up um, second in a row, which means my brother got all the guinea pig vegan food, <laughs> and I got it three years later. So by that time, it was really good. <laughs> but I, I grew up with a mom who knew how to cook some of these things, and I'm even I'm in the middle of like trying to make the cookbook, and the cookbooks that we do out tonight, by the way, are vegan. They're plant based, and they're amazingly tasty food. Um, but I think sometimes we think we need to go cold turkey, but I, I just want to remind everyone, we know it's a process, it takes time, but I think that the biggest key to get out of all of this is to realize so far that obviously more plant-based, whole grain, you know, whole foods, we're going to be healthier. You know, the, in the China study, it showed that, you know, some people, that the meat was just a very small part of their diet. The rest was a lot of plants and, you know, plant-based foods. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the ratio of how much fresh we're getting, how much of these, you know, bright colored foods we're actually getting. But if you want to look into some of the uh, research, studies and research, we're going to go back one slide. I'll just show you this real quick. Hmm, it's not in there. I wonder if it's just me added it later, that's weird. But if you want to write this down, I'll just tell you really quick. Um, there's, there's four different resources that I think would be a real blessing. One of them he already mentioned, and that's Force Over Knives. Check out that documentary and just look into some of the studies. It'll give a lot of um, what, where we're coming from with this. And then the China study, that is a very deep book. It'll put you to sleep if you're not careful, because it's so deep. But the China study by uh, Colin Campbell, and then another one by Joel, Dr. Joel Furman called Eat to Live. There's, there's a few just to get started, but you can just Google plant-based diet books and you'll get a list of 41 of them with all these different things that you can read, the studies that back this up. Um, but we do know that in a perfect world, there was no killing and that they had a plant-based diet. But we know, obviously, all the way in between the fall of sin and the new world that people eat meat, right? Where did meat come from? Why did people start eating meat? How did it actually enter the human diet? And really, we can go back to the flood. Um, if you look at, at different parts of Genesis, we can see that at the flood, there was a specific command given by God to make sure that certain animals got onto the ark. And let's look, let's look at that verse in the Bible. It's Genesis 7. I go to Genesis 7, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. So it's the beginning of your Bible. It's easy to get to. Genesis 7, and verse 1 and 2. It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household. 
because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also seven each of birds, of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. And then he goes on to say that there's going to be a flood that will come and wipe out everything. And now the interesting thing is, after the flood, God gave them something very specific. In Genesis chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. This is as soon as the flood is over. I mean, what would happen? You've got a worldwide flood. What's going to happen to all the vegetation? Bye. It's going to be gone, right? Absolutely no, no plants, no seeds, no fruits. That's going to take time for this stuff to grow back. So what does God do? In chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. Ever wondered why animals can be afraid of us as humans? <laughs> um, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, which he's referring back to Genesis chapter 1. And then in verse 4 it says, But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So the interesting thing here, you know, you can read it and think, Oh, that means that I can eat everything now, you know? But I believe that God was giving it in context of two chapters earlier, where he had said there's clean and there's unclean, and everything that moves that's clean, you can eat. And he reiterates that. Um, I'll show you this really quick, you can look it up later, but he reiterates it in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Um, clean and unclean foods, and he says don't eat this and eat this, and he's giving all these health laws to the Israelite people. The interesting thing is, though, as you look at these lists, um, the ones that are clean end up being something that the system can deal with, and the ones that are unclean, like look at something like the vulture or the buzzard. Um, they're ones who specifically have a lifestyle that produces in them meat that would be extremely unhealthy. Uh, it's interesting, the Marines actually did research when they were out stationed somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, and they had to do research on what fish they could eat. Um, they spent over a quarter of a million, uh, quarter of a million dollars on research to figure out what they could actually eat while they were out there in the middle of nowhere. And they came up with one thing. They said, eat, you can only eat fish that have fins and scales. It can't only have fins and it can't only have scales. Sorry. Um, only, only fins and scales. So here, it's, a, it's amazing to think that they spent all that money when they could have just read Leviticus 11 and realized that it was so read the Bible. But, but God, God knew what he was doing. He didn't want us to eat those scavengers that were on the bottom, getting all the dirt up, you know, because that dirt becomes a part of us. So I, I believe that laws are meant to bring blessing. So God obviously knows the creatures that he's created and knows which ones would be clean or unclean. So that's how meat entered the diet. Was it God's original plan? Uh, you know, if we're supposed to live in a world without sin, it doesn't look like it would be his original plan. But he allowed it because of the flood, because of no vegetation. That's very interesting when we look at this, and, and we could do a whole series just on health. Uh, we're just giving you a, a short little taste and tidbit into what uh, our diet does to us. And when we go back to that plant-based whole foods diet, it's amazing what kind of energy, uh, the weight loss, the, the thinking clearly. There's so much that comes to life within us when we go back to that original diet. And you know, for the stuff that God has given us, Satan has given us a counterfeit. And we're going to talk about some other things in life now that, that people struggle with and with health, uh, you know, with air. God has given us air, right? And then Satan has, Satan has given us smoking. And I don't think we need to go through a whole thing on why smoking is bad for us. Thank goodness some people have figured it out. That it is detrimental 
to our health. But then there's something else in here that we want to take a look at that sometimes people want to, is it a big deal? Is it really that, you know, is it bad for me? So let's look at this next slide here. Proverbs 20, verse 1. It says this, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not what? Wise. Wise. This idea of alcohol that's been brought into the world, and I don't think we need to go through all the statistics, we'll go through some, of what alcohol has done to our society today. But I also want to look at one more verse. Go to Proverbs. It's page 628. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29, and we're going to read through 35. Proverbs 23, verse 39, and we're going to read through 25. 35, sorry. 29 and 35. <clears throat> Page 628. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls smoothly around. And the last, it bites like a serpent. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake that I may seek another drink? Very interesting description here. And you know, as a young person today, I have friends who, who come to me and say, Is it really? A, does the, the Bible doesn't really ever say, Do not drink. It just says, Bad things happen if you get drunk. Right? And we can argue about what, what the point is, how many can have it, how many blah, blah, blah. But here's what I here's what I ask them. If I were to ask you to give me a list of verses as to why you do not believe in polygamy, would you you could come up with some verses? Yeah, don't, don't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Genesis 1, 2, uh, Cleave and Cleave. And here's what I would suggest. I don't think anybody in here believes in polygamy, right? More than, more than one wife, more than one spouse, right? right? Oh, no, the Bible is very clear. One man, one woman. And here's my, here's my challenge to some of you. And what I have found, and maybe you can look and you'll find something different, the Bible talks a whole lot more about wine as a strong drink than it does about one man and one woman. So my question is, why do we believe in one man and one woman when it says a whole lot less about that? <laughs> than what it says about the strong drink. Anyways, it's just... Just something to think about as we think about these things. You know, I think God has given us, and we all, we all have seen the effects of alcohol here. There are 25 million alcohol-related deaths per year worldwide. 2.5, not 25, sorry. Alcohol is more likely to kill young people than all illegal drugs combined. I would imagine that the Lord probably has some things to say about this, and that it's not going to be healthy for us. Alcohol-related problems cost the U.S. an estimated $185 billion per year in what we have to spend to fix the effects of alcohol. And so the question is, if God is looking for us to, to feel better and to be better and to be restored, are there things in His Word that help us do that naturally things that we can do naturally that work within the laws that God has created where the natural result is a blessing 
Look at 3 John chapter, well, it's not chapter 2, there's only one chapter in it, so it's just 2. 3 John 2, he says this, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may what? Prosper, Prosper in all things and be in health. health, just as your soul Prosper. prospers. And I like this, that you may be in health, just as your soul what? Prosper. See, a lot of times when we think about being saved and we think about salvation, we think that all God came to do was to save us spiritually. But He came to save us holistically so that we can be happy, healthy, and full of energy. And it's not something that He requires so that we can go to heaven, but it's something that He's given us so that we can live that healthy, 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 happy life. And so we can live it abundantly. I want to look at a Greek word here. It's called sozo. It means save. To deliver, liberate, make well, heal. What's that word? Restore health and make whole. And here's the interesting part. When you read the Bible and it uses this word save, this is the word, sozo. It's not just talking about saving the spiritual, but also the physical and the mental. The whole person is what it's talking about. Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I'm going to look at a story here. Luke chapter 8 is page 1002. 1002 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 8, <coughs> we're going to look at 43. Luke chapter 8, we're going to look at 43 through 48. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, her flow of blood stopped. There's so many things that are awesome in this story, but we're just going to focus here on the end. Verse 45, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter, when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude and throng are pressing on you, and you say, Who touched me? Come on. There's people all around you. He's like, No, but somebody... Me. But Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I perceived power going out from me. Verse 47, now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him, and she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Now the interesting part that I find in the story is that why did Jesus, why did he point out this woman? And I believe that Jesus pointed out this woman because he wanted to share her testimony. And here's her testimony. Look at verse 48. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has what? Made you well. In the Greek, that's the... I'll go back. Now you your fault, my fault. In the Greek, it is sozo. Your faith has made you whole. It has made you sozo. It has delivered you, liberated, made you well. It has healed you. It has restored your health. It has made you a whole person again. <clears throat> and then we find in another verse, in Matthew 1, 21. And this is very interesting here. This is, this is the angel talking about this guy named Jesus who's come, come, going to come into the world and she shall bring forth, talking about Mary, and she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will sozo his people from their sins. You see, sin has not just been affecting our spiritual nature. Sin has affected our spiritual it has affected our physical, and it has affected our mental capabilities to function as a whole person in this world. And so when, when he writes here that he came to save his people from their sins, it's saying he came to save us from it all. Amen. Amen. 
The commands that he has given are not random, arbitrary, just because I want to see if you'll do it. But it's for our benefit and for our blessing. I have yet to find somebody who says, I changed my lifestyle and my diet. I feel so much better. I think so much clearer. But oh, this is so terrible. <laughs> Maybe there's someone out there. And I think that this is important because when we look at the woman who touched Jesus, he wanted to make sure that people knew that she had experienced this holistic saving. Heidi's going to share a testimony of one of our students from St. Gabriel Academy who discovered something very interesting. Yeah, he experienced so much in his life. This is Stanley, sweet kid. There you can see him on the screen. Stanley came from Korea several years ago. He wasn't religious in any way and had grown up in a home that wasn't religious. But when he came from Korea, he stayed with a family who was. And that family took him to church each week. And every single week, he, he hated church. He was just like, I don't want to be here because he felt like he was kind of being forced to go. But the interesting thing is, he was walking around on campus at San Gabriel Academy, and he ended up looking on the ground and he found a little pamphlet called Steps to Health. And this, this little pamphlet is, is what you'll be getting tonight in your, in your handout. But he picked up the Steps to Health and he started reading it. It's a little pamphlet that just talks about steps to a healthier life. And as he started reading it, he started applying the principles that he had found in this small little paper. In six months, he had lost 20 pounds and was feeling so much better about life. This is a 15-year-old kid, by the way. <laughs> yeah. There's eight principles that he found inside of this small steps to health tract eight principles, and he put into practice seven of them, all of the ones having to do with his physical health. And he saw this major impact and change in his life. And because of it, he said, you know, I'm going to try the, the eighth one, which the eighth one was trust in God. So he started trying trust in God. And he decided to open up his Bible. He decided to open up um, the Word of God, understand it, pray. And as he started reading it, he said, you know, this is really hard to understand. So he called his pastor and he said, hey, can you, can you give me Bible studies? I don't know how to understand this. He went through Bible studies and six months later, he decided to get baptized. And he was so excited. You know, he's like this little tract. He says, it changed my life. He's just like, it just changed my life. The principles that I found in there. He ended up telling his parents and his family that he wants to be a pastor. And for, for his family, they're not super excited about that because um, it's kind of looked down upon in his, in his culture or in, in his family. But he wants to be a pastor and he wants to share what he's learned. Now, the eight principles that he started applying in his life are super simple. Something that all of us can apply starting today. And I'm going to put them on the screen. It's something called New Start. It's a super simple way of living life. And I, I try to think about these things as I go through life to think about, you know, how can I continue to improve my health in what areas am I lacking and all that kind of stuff. But with, with New Start, the N stands for nutrition, um, plant-based whole foods. E stands for exercise, trying to get consistent exercise. I know that's one of my biggest struggles. My husband can totally attest to that. It's extremely hard for me to get consistent exercise, and that's where I want to improve. Uh, water, drinking 8 to 10 glasses per day, sunlight. We really only need about 5 to 10 minutes per day, and we can get our vitamin D. <laughs> Temperance, um, abstaining from the things that are harmful and self-control with the things that are really good. Then air, I know in uh, LA we have to like scoop up the air, we can see it, but <laughs> get it as fresh and as clean as you possibly can. Uh, rest, the um, best hours are before midnight, always. Um, I, I've heard from some studies that like an hour before midnight is, is just as refreshing as two hours afterwards. And then trust in God, um, having time with him and letting go of worries. But this is what Stanley put into practice in his life. Lost 20 pounds in six months. 
and totally, his whole life just changed um, with so much happiness. When I look at him now, I'm just like, you are a totally different Stanley than I ever, you know, thought was before. And it's just such a blessing to see that God has given us something that we can apply to our lives and have abundant life. The verse that I'd like to end with is John 10, 10. It says, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. God, God desires us to have abundant life. And praise God, the creator of our, our bodies is, is very clear in ways that we can continue in that health that he's given us. In the midst of a world that's full of sin and all of its effects, he wants us to have abundant life. And I know that that is, that is a personal desire of mine, to have abundant life day by day. And tonight, as we make that decision, pull out those little resolution cards on your table. And let's make a resolution tonight to do whatever we can do. Um, I know that there's many different steps that someone could take right now. Um, but what is the step that God is calling you to make um, tonight? How can, how can we make those steps towards that abundant life that Jesus has for us? But let's look at that resolution card right now, John. It's Jesus 10, 10. pretty simple. It says, I can see God's wisdom in the original Eden diet given to Adam and Eve. And two, I want the fullness of abundant life Jesus has offered me. Because of this, I desire to live in accordance with his health principles by refraining from harmful things and by eating, drinking, and doing only those things that promote whole body health. Now, I know it is a journey, and so I pray that tonight each of us can choose. I know for me, I need to exercise. <laughs> um, but what can we do towards that abundant life that God wants us to have? We can take a few minutes right now just to share um, maybe thoughts or personal desires. Um, we'll take it just a couple minutes and then I'll pray at the end. But you can share with your, your team and partners. It's well, the left belt in order. Change, changing, eating habits, consuming. With a plant, with a plant, please no change.
insulation, that insulation.